Hi there. Welcome to a quick video on how to em employ a results-based management approach in your monitoring and evaluation practice. If you watched the video that we uh, uploaded before this, we were talking about a results framework and how to develop one. And typically a results framework can go alone within an M&E framework or your funders can request that it actually sits within a results-based management approach to how you do your M&E. And today that's what we'll be talking about. What is this approach and how does it work? My name is Mutsu Karol Chinyamakovu from Data Lab Africa. And if you're new to this channel, we talk about all things M&E here. I hope you enjoy this video. Now let's get right into it. As we begin and as we progress, I'd like you to keep three things in mind. Whenever you're working on a project, the principles of RBM are essentially to constantly ask yourself, number one, what do we want to achieve? Number two, what have we achieved? Number three, what can we do differently to increase the chances of meeting our objectives? And these three questions are asked constantly. Now let's get into the actual principles of RBM. As we just mentioned now, RBM seeks to answer the question, what do we want to achieve? Here, we're talking about objectives at different levels. You can be as broad as possible. If you remember in the results framework video before this one, we spoke about outputs leading to outcomes leading to impact. And some people try to stick to those three levels or force their scenario to fit in those three levels. But in practice, your achievements or your goals, um, or the things, the objectives that you seek um, to make or to effect, they can have multiple levels of causality. You can require that somebody, first of all, has an understanding of business acumen so that, secondly, they can brainstorm what businesses are available to them and how they could possibly sustainably and profitably run one. So that, number three, they can actually attempt to run a business so that number four, they can establish a small business that supports them, that has evidence of existing and maybe even hires people so that number five, they're able to sustain their own families financially or even create opportunities for their community, economically speaking. All of these are different levels of causality. So be as broad as you need to be when you're thinking about what you want to achieve and how it must happen. And let's talk a little bit more about that. How must it happen? How do we want to achieve it? Think very, very carefully about the causal relationships. And further to that, think about the assumptions you're making. What are the assumptions about the circumstances in which you are engaging? the community and its status? What are the assumptions about the people with whom you are engaging and what they are capable of? Number three, you want to ask yourself how you are going to monitor and evaluate that program. You need a clear monitoring method that's assessing your progress as you go and evaluating your outcomes. Not just are we meeting them or not, but how well are we meeting them? Finally. And this is my favorite, how are we going to manage learnings? If you've read up on RBM, often they don't have this fourth step in the theory. It's usually kind of implied. The whole point of using the results approach, results-based approach, is so that you can be responsive to the results that you see. How do you adapt when you see certain results? That's what this approach is about. A lot of people think that this is a golden thread through and it doesn't deserve mention, but I like to mention it because if you put a plan in place when you put your framework together about how you're going to manage your learnings, 
you'll notice that your project can move along swiftly with a lot less resistance. Change management is a difficult thing to employ when it creeps up on you. But if you've already put up a system that says, okay, if something that we don't expect happens, how are we going to decide what to do next? What data do we want? How do we want to validate that data? Who's at that table? And what else are they using for their decision-making process? What is the process that comes after that? And how long do we want to run it to see if this adaptation makes sense for our project? All of these are important things to consider. Do we want to be able to revert back to plan A and under what circumstances? All of these things are so important and make your life so much easier if you just lay out a plan ahead of time to say, if things don't go as planned, this is the process to be implemented. Now let's chat a little bit about the results framework. We mentioned it in the previous video, but I'd like to reinforce a few things here within the framework of results-based management. We already know that ultimately we have some long-term goal or achievement that we are trying to make. And this is at a very high level. We want to reduce poverty in this community, or we want to reduce oppression on marginalized communities, whatever the particular impact or long-term goal you want to make may be. To be able to do this, you will have some inputs available to you in terms of time, labor, financial resources, the stakeholders that want to engage. And you'll take all of these inputs and come up with a range of activities to implement your intervention. This can be workshops or trainings. It can even be something like building a clinic. Whatever you do here is in a sense informed or um, capacitated by the inputs and the resources that you have available. Now, the immediate results of your activities, we call those immediate results outputs. And this is normally what you were able to say as soon as the intervention has happened. We trained 50 people today. Such and such knowledge was gained. Um, three clinics were built. All of these are immediate results. There are also short-term results of the program. And by short term, I mean with respect to the impact. So if we have trained 50 people and if they've gained this knowledge, what do we want to change in their lives? What attitude or uh, mindset shifts do we want to see? What subsequent actions are they going to take as a result of having engaged with our intervention or with our program? We call these outcomes. A lot of people stop here when they're doing their reporting and their measuring, but always think about how this leads to your impact and how you want to be able to show that you've made the impact that you set out to achieve. Ultimately, if you are clear on the various items that you're trying to achieve and how you're going to make it happen, as we said before, then you can map out the causality. You can map out the causality of each of your outcomes using this structure. It will help ensure that you have effective measurement of success at the right times, you have optimal resource allocation, and that you can manage your risks. So again, I'll reiterate, be clear on what you are trying to achieve and how you will make it happen. Let's move on to the factors that will set you up for success. If you're applying for funding, you want to be able to stand out. It's not enough to just have an indicator framework. You need to think about what else will make the funders predisposed to selecting you for this project. Firstly, a clear monitoring method. Don't plan to just wing it. A lot of people think it's okay to stop with your theory of change and your indicator framework, and that shows that you've put some thought into your M&E. But you can go as far as identifying for each indicator 
who should be responsible for that indicator? What data do you want to collect and how often so that you can track if you're going to meet your targets on it? What are the risks associated with measuring that particular indicator? All of these make sure that you know at what cadence you're going to be measuring the various things you need to measure and what are the outputs of that process. Secondly, make sure you have your outcome mapping clear and laid out so that your funder can see that you already know how that behavior change is going to come about and you have planned for it. It's very easy to end up with a missing middle. A missing middle is when, for example, you train 7,000 people and maybe you're training them in how to save money. You come back six months later, they haven't saved any money <laughs> or very few of them have saved money. So you can say you hit your target, but you can't really show what happened in between you actually running your training and showing up to see if their lives had changed because of it. We call that a missing middle. When you map your outcomes, when you take the time to think about what changes in behavior you want to see and how, where, and when you're going to measure these, you give yourself the room to make even more impact you are able to then allocate resources to that period in between finishing the workshop and wanting to see the impact or the change. That period is often unfunded. For a lot of people, it's a source of pain because you can say you've done this work, but you can't really say that you see the evidence of what you did present in people's lives. Third, if you make sure that your monitoring and evaluation framework is data-centered, that your indicators have baselines and target values, and you've identified the cadence at which you want to monitor the progress towards these targets, then your funders are assured that your process is being validated. It's being measured frequently enough, accurately enough so that it's not just guesses or word of mouth reports, it's actual hard data tracking the multiple components of your program. Another thing that sets you up for success is a commitment to revealing progress. Please, whatever you do, don't just measure for the sake of having numbers. Aim to show progress. Often reports will have lots of numbers and lots of graphs, and then they'll have one page where they summarize everything in an executive summary. And if you're lucky, the executive summary might actually tell you how your project is progressing, but sometimes it's just a summary of the numbers. You want to make sure that you are committed to showing how far towards the goal you are, whatever that means, whether quantitatively, or qualitatively. Finally, make sure your reporting is informative. Have a clear assessment of your results. If this analysis or your data is unclear, it makes you appear dodgy. If you appear dodgy in your data, your entire project comes into question. So clearly articulate what you're achieving, what you are learning, what the data is saying, and make sure that you are also showing them what you plan to do following this point in time. What can they expect to see from you in the months to come? These factors are not typically found in an m &E framework, but they're such brilliant ways of setting yourself apart as having gone the extra mile to make sure that you meet your objectives. Now, I'd like to reinforce one idea that I mentioned briefly. Quality is a very underrated measurement when it comes to M&E. People want to talk about the numbers a lot. 
people don't really value the power of a success story or even a failure story or of a change story or of someone's thoughts before and after, just something that qualifies the work that you're doing. The emphasis in RBM is on learning on, from our results and on adapting as we go. The emphasis is not on pinning down the targets that you set out for each indicator as it is with other M&E approaches. So yes, you've aimed to hit 7,000, but what if you hit 7,000 and those 7,000 people don't start saving as we said earlier? You meet your target, but you don't achieve the result. So take the time, take the time to adjust your model. Train 700 people, figure out if it's working. Is the idea landing? Are people's behaviors changing? What are you doing after your trainings to reinforce what you have told them? And if it's not working, change your model again and change it as many times as you need to until you've got a model that works. It is a lot better to hit 2,000 people who are saving out of a target of 7,000 than to train 7,000 people and have no idea whether they ever started saving or you have an idea and they, it was just a really poor workshop. Not to say that your trainings aren't good, but that your allocation of resources went towards making sure you had chicken, for example, at your training, as opposed to showing up again in that community to see them after the training and reinforce some of the ideas you wanted them to hold on to. How do you allocate your resources to achieve the outcomes you set out to achieve? I'd like to leave you with this quote from Jack Dixon, who is a rugby player. Sportsmen are the best examples of how to achieve goals because they have a lot of discipline that goes into it. And so I thought it would be great to borrow a quote from sports. Jack Dix Dixon says this, if you focus on results, you will never change. But if you focus on the change, you will get results. If you've ever tried to do a diet or work out and you failed, you know that this is true. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for listening to this short video. My name is Mutsa from Data Lab Africa. My details are down below. If you'd like to see a little bit more on how to develop the results framework, the previous video we uploaded is up in the corner there. If you liked this video and would love to see more, please like it and subscribe to our channel. Thanks and see you next time.